for your soul, babe. Life ain't always pretty, but hey, it's pretty beautiful, fam. Laugh a little more, fam. Tight, tighten up your core, fam. Said EK, you're kicking it with four things. With Amy Brown. Happy Thursday, everybody. Amy here. And I'm just going to tell you that today's episode is very diverse. The four things are not related at all whatsoever. The first thing is a quick one on plate comparing. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's something that many of us do when we're eating around others. And I think it's time that we stop. If you're not familiar with it, I'll tell you about it. And you can see if you do it to yourself or to others. And we just need to be more aware of it and just want to send some encouragement about that. The second thing is about signs from loved ones that have passed away. Do you believe in that? I didn't until last week. And I'll tell y'all what has been going on with me And I want to hear y'all's thoughts on it. The third thing is a follow-up with Cassie Hammett, my guest from a few weeks ago that came on to educate us on human trafficking in America. Now, she got a question from one of you, so we addressed that and share how to best approach a situation with someone that we think might be in a sexual exploitation situation. Now, the advice that she shares could actually apply to more than just the topic at hand. You could insert alcohol abuse or drugs or really any risky behavior into this conversation. And I think that Cassie's wisdom could apply. And then lastly, the fourth thing is my friend Megan. She's been on the podcast before talking about microblading my eyebrows. And we do kind of end up chatting about that again in case any of you didn't hear that and you're thinking about getting that done. But we talk about finding passion with a side hustle. And she shares her journey in finding that as a single mom and hopes to encourage others. And then it's super fun because Megan is also a makeup artist. So she shares some tips on contouring and highlighting, which I'm not very good at. So there you go. I told you today's episode is very diverse, but I hope you enjoy it. Here you go. First thing. That's right. Ah. So I want to start off this first thing by saying that comparison is the thief of joy. And I don't know who originally said that. I don't think it's an original thought. It certainly wasn't me, but I've read that over and over, you know, in the years of my life. It's just, it's a known thing that when you spend your time comparing yourself to others, no matter how that looks, it's a thief of joy. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go into plate comparing, which is a real thing. And I was out to dinner the other night with some girlfriends um, safely. We wore masks to our table. The restaurant handled it really well. These are girls that I see anyways, and I know that they haven't been exposed to anything, and they're, we're kind of quarantined in the same group of people. Like There's certain people that I've been hanging out with and not. So I know just depending on what part of the country you live in, what COVID is like in your region, uh, and, or maybe just personally how you're handling the virus, uh, you might be like, wait, what? Amy's going out to eat with a bunch of friends. And it wasn't like that at all. Just a couple of girlfriends safely went out to eat, supporting a local restaurant here in Nashville. And it was a really great time. Enjoyed it a lot. But as we were looking at the menu and trying to decide what to order, one of my girlfriends said, oh my gosh, I used to never be able to order the same thing as anybody else when we were out to eat because she would instantly feel as though she didn't have the freedom to eat as much as she wanted to because she feared that if another person ordered exactly what she got, then her portion would be over on their plate. And what if they didn't eat as much? And it would instantly be evident. And she didn't want that. So she would always order something different. And I thought, wow, okay, well, I've never done that. I've never not ordered what somebody else is ordering, but I certainly have looked at somebody else's plate and thought to myself, oh, they still have half of their food on their plate. I better move my food around to make sure it looks like I still have some food there when really maybe I had eaten more. And I don't know why we do this, but it's more common than you think. Because then like two days after that, I get home and I see another friend of mine Uh, post a quote from a doctor, Dr. Colleen Reichman on Instagram, like in stories. And my friend just put, hey, this is something I really struggle with. So I wanted to share this with anyone else that needs this as a reminder. And then here's the quote from the doctor that she posted. 
let's make it a goal to stop plate comparing. It doesn't matter if your housemate is vegan. It doesn't matter if your partner goes long stretches without eating. Doesn't matter if your mom grazes throughout the day instead of eating full meals. Your body, your needs, eyes on your own plate. And so while this isn't necessarily a reminder for when, for when you're out to eat and it's, you know, I think figuratively they're even talking about a plate here when, when they're talking about how people in your life eat or literally if you're at a restaurant or you're out to eat at somebody's house or something and you're comparing the actual food on the plate, however someone eats, it doesn't matter if it's not your body, you don't have to go mimic and copy and do whatever anybody else is doing. You need to be concerned about your body, your food intake, what you want for you, and then let other people do the same. Now, plate comparing goes both ways. You can be concerned about what people are seeing on your plate, but then also we can be annoying, which this has been me. I am putting my hand in the air, guilty of judging what is on other people's plates. Like, are you really going to eat that? I know that I've, you know, my sister was on the podcast last Thursday talking about how I made her feel anxiety or uncomfortable around certain food choices she was making just because I didn't think they were maybe the best choices. And that was wrong of me. I know that I've done it to my husband and I really was just projecting my own food issues onto them. So the plate comparison goes both ways. Just focus on what you're on your own plate uh, and don't worry about what other people are eating. But then as people, we also need to, you know, not judge what other people are eating. So, you know, next time you're at a friend's house eating, make the same exact plate as somebody else. Next time you're out at a restaurant, order the same thing as somebody else. Who cares if you eat less, if you eat more, if you want to eat the rolls that come out at dinner beforehand? I mean, and that was another thing. I bring that up because at dinner, this restaurant had these amazing pretzel bun rolls like soaked in butter. And I'm so glad I'm in a place where I'm uh, uh, at a healthier place in my journey with food freedom because I ate the roll and it was amazing and my life wasn't over. But my friend made a joke after we were talking about it. We ended up ordering the same exact thing. And so when we got done eating, I had eaten all my scallops and she still had one scallop left. So I jokingly looked at her and said, oh, you didn't eat your last scallop. And she goes, oh, it's okay. You... Um, I ate my whole roll and you still had a bite left. And I didn't even realize that I had a bite left, but she noticed that. And now we're we're close friends, so we were able to joke and talk about it. And she knows my struggles with food and I understand some of hers. So it was a safe space. But in a normal, healthy setting, you know, if someone's struggling and you're not trying to point something out, you never would need to bring up whether or not they finished the meal or didn't finish the meal. It's nobody's business. But I will say, if the rolls are out there and they look good, eat the dang roll. Who cares? It's worth it. And I'll close with this for the first thing. Comparison steals joy. I opened with that. I'll close with it. Comparison is the thief of joy. So just keep that in mind as you enter your weekend. Second thing. We got to talk about cardinals real quick and what they symbolize, at least for my sister. So here's the deal. My mom passed away in 2014 and she was in a hospice care situation, but we set up hospice in my sister's master bedroom at her house. And uh, about maybe a week after my mom passed away, my sister noticed this bird's nest in a tree outside of her bedroom window. And there's three little eggs in there. Then she waited for them to hatch to see what they were. They opened up and it was some baby cardinals. So then she started to have this whole feeling of like, oh, mom is here. This is a representation of the full circle of life. And now new life is being born after we just lost a life. And then she Googled uh, what cardinals symbolize. And she saw that joy was one of the main things. And if y'all listen to the podcast, you know that my mom's battle was centered around joy. She uh, had cancer, but made her motto, choose joy no matter what she went through. She tried to 
see the good and spread joy to others and choose joy for herself, even though things were really, really hard. I mean, pimp and joy, the whole thing. So I always would roll my eyes at my sister and this cardinal thing because it started with the three eggs that hatched and they were cardinals. Then she Googled it. Then it equals joy. So now she's like, oh, this is mom sending me a sign that everything's going to be fine. So for the last six years, anytime she sees a cardinal, she thinks of my mom and thinks it's my mom's way of letting her know she's here. And I've never really bought into it. Well, my sister was in town about a week ago and we had some tough conversations that we were having to have. And I was really stressed out and some anxiety, just uh, so uncertain about some things. And then a red cardinal flies outside my kitchen window. And my sister looks at me and says, mom's here. Everything's going to be fine. And I sort of roll my eyes again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then a few days later, I am outside a parking spot at work and there's a tree in front of me. And I'm on the phone with a friend talking about the exact same subject that my sister and I were working through. So I was feeling just uneasy. Again, some of the stress around it was back. And I look up and in the tree, there is a red cardinal. So I get up my phone and I take a picture because I cannot believe it. And I text the picture to my sister. And immediately when I saw the cardinal and as I'm on the phone with my friend, I hear my sister's voice. Mom's here. Everything's going to be fine. And it really did give me some sort of peace for the first time. This is mean, yeah, for the first time, not act- not rolling my eyes. And I think, oh, no, am I actually buying into this now? So then I send the picture of the cardinal to my sister on text because she's since left town. And she replies back real nonchalantly like, oh, yeah, duh. I'm not surprised you saw that because here was her reply. Oh, yes, yes. One lives on Katie's porch in Austin, which I guess is me talking now. Katie uh, is my mom's best friend, who also happens to be my sister's mother-in-law. But longer story, all of our families are are (laughs) intertwined. So anyway, she goes, oh, yes, yes. One lives on Katie's porch in Austin and constantly runs into the window. I told Katie that story a long time ago, and she says that mom constantly reminds her to go do her Bible study. At least that's what Katie interprets it as when the cardinal bangs against the window. And so I'm like, what? Y'all have these relationships with cardinals, and I'm I'm the only one that's not really feeling that it's mom. And But now I'm all in, and I feel like m- maybe it is. So I'm telling my friend Abby this story, and she looks at me and she said, oh, well, my friend lost her mom like three years ago, tragic incident, and it was really, really hard for her. But she, too, thinks that cardinals are a symbol from her mom that everything is going to be fine. And now my friend Abby, she legit, there's a cardinal that shows up in her backyard every day, and she thinks it's for her friend's mom. And she told me to Google the the thing about cardinals because— I mean, she's like, you'll be shocked. And so when my sister originally Googled about cardinals, all she found was the joy part, which made sense for my mom. So then I do like my friend Abby says, and I look it up, and here's what I find. According to superstition, keyword there, but maybe we believe it now, if you see a cardinal, one of your loved ones wants you to know that they are watching over you and you're not alone. Again, seeing a cardinal at your window usually means that someone who has passed on wants you to know that they're thinking of you and looking out for you. What? I had no idea. My sister had never told me that part, but I don't even think she had even read that part. I mean, she had it because then later I share her with her what I Googled because Abby told me about it. So anyway, I didn't know there was this whole thing about cardinals, but now I might be in. I mean, maybe it is my mom is away of letting us know that everything's going to be okay. So just wanted to share this with y'all to see if you have any animals or flowers or something in nature or a way uh, that you feel a loved one is communicating with you in a sense. And if y'all have those, you can email me for things with Amy Brown at gmail.com, share them with me. I would like to hear about them. And you know, I, I think I'm also comfortable and okay with the fact that if this is all just nothing, which it might be, 
it has still brought me comfort and peace during this time of stress and anxiety and hearing my sister's words of mom's here, everything's going to be fine. And the bird, the, the red cardinals, well, I mean, of course they're red, cardinals are red, but you know what I mean? Anytime I see a cardinal, I, I'm, I'm now, the last week I've been given that, that comfort. So I think that that's okay too. Even if it's not my mom, it's okay. It doesn't matter. It brought me the comfort that I needed and it's bringing my sister comfort. And it's reminding my mom's best friend to go do her dang Bible study because my mom's reminding her, you know, whatever it is, I think that that is okay too. Um, So just wanted to share this with y'all because I thought it was crazy and a little weird, but also awesome. So excited to have my friend Megan on today, and this isn't your first time. No, you come on before to talk about microblading eyebrows because that is how I met you. I had a really bad microblading experience, not with Megan, like it was really bad. <laughs> and then I think Kelsey Ballerini or somebody posted about you, and I thought, oh, I'm just going to DM her and show her a picture of my eyebrows and say, hey, can you help me? So then we started DMing and I made an appointment with you and you said, well, I can help you, but not until you get those lasered off. So then you had me laser them off, but you sent me to Carrie, who's at the Nashville Beauty Girl, who I talk about a lot on the podcast. And so that's how I met Carrie. I wouldn't have met Carrie if it wasn't for you sending me to her. Then she lasered them off and then you fixed them. And so now she's the current reason for my brows. Because really, guys, I have no eyebrows. I plucked them all off in my late teens. I think I was looking at my college graduation picture. Yeah. I kid you not. It was like a pencil line. That was cool, though. Like if you think about like Gwen Stefani and like in the 90s, like there's literally it's like one little hair connecting to another. And that was like that was the look. It was. <laughs> and I also in college love to wear white eyeliner. Was that the look? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I see a picture of that for sure. I don't even want to show you guys. It's so bad. But I just wanted to say thank you because you've given me my confidence back with my eyebrows and you're very amazing at what you do. So tell people your Instagram, first of all, in case they want to hit you up about microblading yes. questions. Yes. So it is beauty underscore by underscore Megan. M E E. G E N. There you go. Yeah. The underscores are all there. Yeah. I know. I I hate that I had to, but there was no other way. So I was like, well, son of a gun, but we got him. We got to do it. It's (laughs) okay. But people can see your work before and after. And I actually just went in for a touch up the other day. And that's when we got to talking. And I said, well, why don't you come on the podcast? Because I think you're an entrepreneur. You're a woman. I admire and respect you. You're a mom. And you are doing what you need to do for your family and your wellness. And I just thought you could be encouragement to some of my other listeners that might be thinking about starting a business. I know that this is not why you did Beauty Counter to start with, but it is a way to help provide for your family. 100%. And I have used Beauty Counter, done endorsements on the podcast, and just thought, you know, this may be an encouragement to some of my listeners. And not that you have to do Beauty Counter by any means. By any means, and I'm talking to you, the listener. But if there's something else you want to tap into, something that you're very passionate about or interested in, and for you, Megan, it was beauty and wellness. Yes. And so, because you're a makeup artist, yes, which you do, celebrity clients here. Celebrity makeup artist. That's a fun (laughs) title. Can't forget the celebrity in there, you know. But yeah, makeup artist. That's what I started out doing when I was 17 years old. I worked at a little makeup store that we have here. And that has been everything that I've ever wanted in life was just all things beauty. And so I think that when it comes to being an entrepreneur, like money always follows. If you're doing what you're passionate about and what you love and that lights, you know, your fire, then money usually follows that. So like you said, like it doesn't have to be beauty counter. It can be anything. And I think actually it was Forbes that just said like, there's no downside to a side hustle, you know, like there's just not. You know, my bread and butter is microblading. I'm a single mom, by the way. So any single mom listeners out there, like, girl, you can do it. Hustle. Like, I have no support from, you know, the other side of of my daughter's family. They've never met them. So it's just me. But I do microblading. That's like my bread and butter. I love it. But I found Beauty Counter through, gosh, it was, honestly, it was a friend of my church. And she introduced it to me because I was looking for a clean option when I was pregnant. I had no desire in changing and, like, going to something clean, even though, 
you know, I eat clean, I try and be healthy, I work out, but I just needed something when I was breastfeeding and pregnant with my daughter. So that's how I found it. And she was like, Megan, like, I've been telling you about this line, like you're a makeup artist. We just tried, you know, we just, you know, launched all this new makeup products and like that stuff that you should be trying. So I was like, okay, you know, I wasn't quite sold on the idea of like switching my makeup or anything. I was just interested in the skincare side of it. And then, you know, for me personally, it was more of kind of that journey of, just discovering, you know, more safe options out there. And And I love that it's a female run business. And again, it doesn't have to be, but just in the sake of empowering and lifting up females in our lives or female businesses, Yeah, I'm sure. And I know that you even mentioned to me, you're like, look, I just kind of started because I wanted to get the discount. Yes. Um, Because again, the microblading is your bread and butter. But then if you're having to support yourself and your daughter and you're not getting any support, like trying the side hustle is great. And I know a lot of women have them. And so I just like that it's encouraging yeah. to me that you found something that you really enjoy and you yes. like, and it ended up turning into starting with a desire to learn more and the passion, and then you actually really like it. And then it morphed into you selling it. And then because you're so passionate and you're really into it, you're good at it. Yeah. yeah. That, and that's a hundred percent what, like, I, I'm not a salesperson. Like I'm, I'm just not but I truly, I believe in things, you know, and it, well, if I believe in something like, I mean, just like if you're going, you know, you found a new restaurant that you love, you're going to tell everyone about it just because you love it. Same thing with products. I know that you love your Zoe products because yeah. Carrie has me on Zio yes. and I love them, yes. but I also do love Beauty Counter and they have this overnight resurfacing peel and mm. it's the jam. It's so good. It tingles, like you feel it. Everyone wants to like feel it when you put stuff yeah. on like you want that like little bit of a burn that you're like oh it's working you know mm-hmm. it's like like when you work out you want yes. you want to hurt a little bit so that's like our bread and butter product like it, it can go along and honestly any of our stuff can go along with any you know other products like there's so many amazing product lines out there how to like contouring mm-hmm. with, since you're a makeup artist how do we do that because whenever I have my makeup done I she does a lot of stuff in my cheek area and I try to pay attention and yes. then my friend Kelly of Velvet's Edge yes. she's that's showed me so a few amazing. things. Yes. She's great. Yes. But like, what areas do you think oh are great to contour? Well, you have the cutest nose in the world. Oh, so well, I you. would not even worry about <gasps> oh, like, you what? have such a good nose. Oh. You have such a good nose. Like highlight the top of it for sure. You know, like okay. along the bridge, but I wouldn't do any like darkness and on the, the tip of your nose. Yes. And the tip just to give that little pretty glow. But okay. On it, I mean, you even have like such, I'm like, what the heck do you even need to hollow? You know, you have such good plump cheeks and like good hollows and your cheekbones and stuff. But If you wanted to do something there, like we have a bronze glow, it's like a little stick. And that's what I literally like. I put my foundation on with my hands and my concealer. I'm not joking. Like my makeup routine is in and out like five minutes, but I take the bronze glow and I just like do little like warrior stripes under my cheek and a little bit on my forehead. Mm -hmm. And then I just blend it in with like a beauty blender. And that's like, that's it. And then I highlight. I'm obsessed with our highlighter. Like Okay. Well, I probably need the stick because I was using a NARS stick, Yeah. yeah. but I literally just ran out. I kid you not. And you're in luck because I went to try to order more and they were sold out okay. of the one I wanted. So now I'm just going to get Done. the beauty counter Done. one. So what's the deal with doing it on the forehead? It just, uh, it just helps. You don't have a big forehead. Yes, you, I do. No. Yes, oh I do. Oh my gosh, you totally oh, don't. Oh no. People, you, no. <laughs> Listeners will take time out of their day to either comment to me or leave me emails about my big forehead <gasps> and they call it a five head. <gasps> no. Which is like, means that you put all five of your fingers up and it'll take up the space okay. on my forehead. But it's not. I'm going to testify. She just put five fingers <laughs> on her forehead and it is not covering all of it. So well, I don't Who think cares? So. Even if someone <laughs> so does I mean, have a big yeah. forehead, it's part of their yeah. life and they were born that way yeah. and you should never comment on somebody's forehead say, yes just don't i don't understand like i know we've all heard like if you don't have anything nice to say just don't say it like i mean if you look at my work and you're like that girl sucks at microblading like please but don't you don't but, <laughs> trust but me just, like, i have gone nice somewhere <laughs> that i did not have a good experience and you don't oh. like you're awesome and i'm sure i'm gonna get tons of emails about that but well, i'll just say that my eyebrows look like caterpillars on my face because I went from having no brows to tons of microbladed brows. And my husband looked at me and said, what in the actual heck is wrong with your face? So I lived that way for eight months until I found you. But it was fate because you were supposed to meet Carrie. Right. So now I had to get, now I know that I had the caterpillar brows for a reason (laughs) and it was to meet you, to meet Carrie and then back to you. So I, yeah, just, just know that it, 
was not a good experience, but Aww. the results have been great. If someone's nervous about doing that, what would you say? Like if they're in their town, if they're in Nashville, yes. they can maybe try to get in with you. Yes. Or I know that you've had people fly in oh. to, to once I did your you. show, I swear. <laughs> like I've literally had people literally fly in from everywhere and they're like, oh, I've heard you on Amy's show. And like, even oh my gosh, cutest thing ever. It was when you, she came to see me um, Friday and you walked out and I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I was like cleaning. I was a couple minutes behind. And my sweet little client goes, I know exactly who you were just with. <laughs> and I said, oh. oh, dude. And she was like, tell her I love her. I love her. <laughs> and so oh, well, that's I was so like, nice. Oh, so sweet. She was like, she's so beautiful in person. I was like, I know. Oh, oh and she but, saw me yeah. walk out with my brows <laughs> freshly <laughs> microbladed. That's so no. sweet. Gorgeous, but gorgeous. I just, if somebody was thinking about doing it again, just refresh people. I know you've come on the podcast before, but it was a long time ago. So yeah. I have new listeners. Yeah. What's the main question they should ask somebody before they let them take a blade to their face? Just be, be honest. I mean, be honest because most people are going to draw it on you first. If they don't draw it on you, because I know there's some people that don't, I would never, I mean, I would just say no, like you are going to draw out a shape that you're going to do on me first. I mean, hands down. I've had several people lately who've come to see me or emailed me for consults because they've had it done. And they're like, oh, the girl didn't even draw anything. She just started going. That's a terrible idea. So first of all, just don't do it. Okay. Um, definitely just speak up. For me as an artist, like this is a baby step process. I, I, you know, always include a touch up with it. I would much rather you come back and say like, I want to add more. You know what I mean? So I do the initial appointment. I draw everything out. I sit you upright. I let you see what exactly I'm going to do. If you don't like anything, speak up. Like it's it's your face, you know? And then as long as we get everything down, you know, I do it. And then 10 to 12 weeks later, you come back in for a little touch up. And I always tell people like to start off more reserved, you know, lighter in color, smaller in shape, because we don't want a situation like that. <laughs> like I you, know, you know, so it's like, you know, we can always add more. OK, be honest. The yeah. other day I came in and I sat down and I had my freshly sharpened eyebrow pencil. Yes. And I went to the mirror and I knew I was getting a touch up, but I was very specific about where yes. I wanted you to touch up. I think because I have PTSD from oh. what happened to me last time. Yeah. But I took out my pencil and yes. I showed you and I drew it in front of you. Yes. Was that annoying? No, no, okay. no. I so yeah, no, you have to you have to speak up because I know from not speaking up, you can end up with something really bad. And mm -hmm. so maybe that's a tip: is yes. that take your own pencil yes. and show the artist yeah. you being or artist. draw them in and before you come in and say, "Yeah, this is how I like my." Brush. Well, I liked you know? being able to show you this is where yes. I'm drawing. Yes. So yes. I think going in bare browed. And Megan's super sweet, so she's saying she didn't find it annoying. And no. I just hope and pray that whoever you're seeing that they don't have too much of an ego to where they can't handle you being like, hey, oh this gosh. is how I draw it in, and this is what I would like. I yeah. guess as long as you draw them in good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you may not have the best. Yeah. Maybe you don't really know the best shape yes. for your face. So I would maybe then take their opinion if that's their profession and you're an yes. artist. Yes, and tons of people do that. They're like, this is your craft, you know, and that's how I am. Like whenever I go to like someone like Carrie or my tattoo artist, I'm covered in tattoos, or if I was going to go to the doctor, like I'm not going to tell my tattoo artist or my doctor how to perform like, you know, surgery. I want the best of the best and I want them to tell me what's going to be best on me. You know what I mean? Yes. And some people aren't like that. Like, you know exactly what you are. But for, for some people, they come in and they say like, this is what you do every day. Like, I want your profession. And then, and I do it and I draw, but again, I draw it out. So I sit them up and I show them and make sure everyone is completely like okay with what we're about to do but it's definitely it never like if someone's ego is too big to where they can't like listen to what you're saying you know i i probably just wouldn't go to something yeah. like that either you know and again unless that's your actual opinion is like i don't know what i want so you tell me you know but no it never bugs me i'm i love that you do that and again it makes it so much easier with the touch-up that's what i tell people i'm like when you come back for your touch-up i want you to tell me what you do or don't like you know and like what you want um, more dramatic or if you want darker or whatever it is, because then it's just like, bam, you know, get you numb. Like, I mean, it probably took you longer to numb than it did to actually like. Oh, yeah. It was so fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's just a quick little easy touch up. And um, yeah. It's and they're healing already nicely. So I just beautiful. saw you the other day and I don't have I don't have any makeup don't have on, anything them. on them. Mm -mm. Nope. Because yeah. I'm, they're supposed to be makeup free for a week. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yep. You know, my son wanted me to go swimming with him and I was like, I can't. And oh. he said, why? <laughs> and I didn't want to say because I got my eyebrows. <laughs> oh, sorry, so so I just sorry. said next weekend, I'll yeah. swim with you. Oh. I know you brought me something yes. else. I know I'm already a fan of the peel. the peel, 
But if you had another highlight product that yes. you want to tell people about, what would it be? It's exactly what's in your hand, the vitamin C. So that's a newer product we launched. Um, it's and what got, does vitamin C do for us? It is it's for pigmentation. So dark pigmentation, which a lot of us have, you know, um, it's going to help get rid of that. And it's also a really good antioxidant. So if you think about all the stuff in the environment, pollutants, things like that, um, we want antioxidants because those are going to help protect those pollutants and things like that from damaging your skin. So in essence, that actually helps to brighten your skin and brighten any dark, you know, spots and hyperpigmentation, but it also helps to protect your skin. Vitamin C is for everyone. Like everyone needs to be using vitamin C every single day. Well, I'm definitely not on a Zo vitamin C oh, <laughs> or Zio yes, or so whatever. Add that to your... So I can add this to my yep. routine. Every morning I use it. Yep. Okay. And sunscreen. I'm sure you already know that. And oh yeah. Sunscreen but, every day for but sure. Yes. it's But those two, like if anyone is like, I don't know what to start out with, like skincare products... Those are like peanut butter and jelly. I mean, you've got to have the resurfacing peel and the vitamin C serum. Those are amazing. And again, it's 10% vitamin C. So it's like highest that you can get. And it is absolutely, it smells wonderful. It kind of gives you a nice little glow before you put on your makeup. So I'm obsessed with that. And then like makeup products, our new foundation is just like the bomb in mm-hmm. our highlighter. I really part. like that. If people want to, and again, Megan is someone that I have admired for a long time and she works hard, but she found something that she was passionate about that's able to give her extra income. And she's working for a company that she's proud to work for yes. and she's proud to be a part of. And so whatever that looks like for you, if you need a side hustle, maybe it is beauty counter. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's something else that you're passionate about, but you can try to find that. But if people want to learn more from you about Beauty Counter, what yeah. can they They can totally go do? to my Instagram and okay. talk to me about that. And so like, the same Instagram. Yep. Yep. I just keep everything on there. Like you said, just find something you love and are passionate about. And it, it's just so, it's so worth it. And just any type of side hustle thing like that, I'm, it's a hundred percent worth it because you get to decide like when and where and like how much you want to put into it. And I've got girls on my team that are like, you know what? I just want to make a little bit of extra money to put my kid through private school. That's awesome. I've got women who are like, no, I want this to like completely like, you know, supplement my whole family's income. And they do. And like they kick my butt and outsell me, you know, like, I mean, that's truly not what it's about. It's about the community and, you know, helping other people. And so it's just been such a blessing through me saying yes, you know, that was able to help other people, you know, change their lives and their family. It's just a cool group of women and cool thing to be a part of that I'm, I'm very proud of. Yeah. Well, yeah. I know it's an amazing company, so I'm pumped that you're a part of it. And I'm <laughs> proud of you knowing you before you had your baby and then now and how old is she now? <laughs> She'll be two in August. Okay. So two. So <sighs> we go back yeah. even and just hearing kind of what you had to go through with some of that and, and knowing like, you were like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it on my own. And that's got to be so scary. And I'm just, (laughs) I'm, I love your heart and I love your work ethic and your drive and your passion. And so I just appreciate you coming on to share your knowledge about makeup and microblading and beauty counter and all the things. So I just appreciate you. So people check out Megan beauty underscore, (laughs) By underscore Megan. And it's M-E-E-G-E-N. Yay! So all E's. Gosh, I don't know how you remembered all that. Good gracious, you're good. She's good at what she does. Well, I follow you on Instagram. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Thank you so much. You're amazing. All right, super thankful to have Cassie Hammett back on with us today because she did a full episode with us a couple of weeks ago about human trafficking because she works with survivors, victims, abusers, all the things. If you missed that episode, I highly encourage you go back and download it, listen it to it. When you are ready for it, <laughs> it is heavy, but I feel like Cassie did an amazing job delivering it to us. And that's the feedback I've gotten, Cassie. Even some people that were you know, listening to my podcast multiple episodes in a row, yours just started playing. And they thought, oh, I don't know if I want to handle this information today. But they went ahead and listened to it because it rolled right into it and that they were like, okay, wow, this was very informative. I needed to know this. 
I'm thankful I didn't turn it off because yeah, while it is heavy, you delivered it in a manner that people could tolerate if it is new to them. <laughs> because I feel as though you could have gotten into a lot of other stuff that would make it even heavier. Mm-hmm. So, and and, you know, I originally wanted you to come on because I know that it's an issue and I know that I just am uninformed and I want to learn more. And so I'm thankful my listeners are on board with that. Their emails have been amazing. They've sent questions in. And I know you got one question in particular that I forwarded on to you because a listener was concerned about one of their social media friends uh, someone that's in their life that they're not super close to at all. They just know them from a like school or something. And the person was selling videos or pictures online for money. And that was a red flag for them because they listened to the podcast and they just didn't know how to handle it. So they wanted your wisdom. So I thought you could come on and just share what you corresponded with the listener about and the advice you gave her and then maybe turn it also to to the direction of, you know, if you have someone to approach that you are actually close to or what do we do if it's a total stranger and you think something is going on? So there's three different levels. The social media don't really know you that well. The, oh shoot, wow, I now that I'm aware of this, something's up with my cousin. This seems weird. Or, oh man, I just saw this girl at a gas station or a hotel and something's not right. Right, yeah. So I'm super thankful to be back on to continue the conversation. And especially since even we last talked, there's been a lot more in the media that has come out about sex trafficking and um, just some things that are going on in, in our nation. So I'm super thankful anytime I get to talk about this stuff. So in the question in particular that came in, it kind of is from the angle of a social media contact. Like you said, the listener had some knowledge of um, the individual. They had a, a relationship in the past, but time had passed and they weren't super connected now. Family member also knows them. So there was a little bit of knowledge there. But what was cool about the question in particular was when reading it, it made me realize that our conversation previously, you and I on the last episode had translated the way that I had prayed it would, which is is not just as facts and figures, but translated and kind of wrapped flesh around people. Because the email question that was sent in was very focused on the person and care for what was going on. And I was super proud that they were able to listen to what we talked about and take some really practical steps at doing something about it. And so um, I think that was just amazing. One of the things that I started with is just reminding her that um, you want to always approach people who are struggling or engaging in, um, in this case, exploitive behaviors online, or not even online, in, in person even, from a relational angle. And what I mean by that is you want to base anything you say or do out of a relational heart for the person. In best case, there's some felt safety between the two of you, primarily for the person who's engaging in that behavior. What I mean by felt safety is that there's some level of trust that's been built between you and them. Uh, We live in a culture of a lot of online assuming, a lot of online blasting of people, kind of pointing the digital finger at each other, right? And it's just, we've lost online, I believe, the human element and kind of that trust earning, right? Because if you think about it, you and I don't know each other super well, except for we've gone through some technical difficulties that have gotten us closer in this moment. (laughs) But we don't know each other super well. And so I would never feel permission to speak directly into your life based on something I see online, right? Like there's a step or two of trust that makes those conversations easier. That applies across the board, whether that's you and I, whether that's someone in homelessness, poverty, addiction. I think we see a cause and we forget that relationship is so important no matter what is going on. So we kind of see a cause or an issue and we want to charge it, right? Like we want to say, this may be happening. We need to put an end to that, but it's not a cause or an issue. In reality, it's a person. When it comes to the segment of the population that's engaging in the sex industry online or maybe an exotic dancing and, and those lanes, prostitution, all of those things, a lot of times, not every time, but in most cases, those individuals have a very long history of not being able to trust. 
And so you have to remember that that behavior you're seeing online is just simply a mirror that's showing you what's going on internally and that we don't need to attack behaviors as much as we need to think about what's under that behavior. And that's going to get you into a relational brain space, right? That goes, I'm not just going to blast her in her DM and be like, you shouldn't be doing this. You're valuable and saying all these really nice things, but all with the word should and shouldn't be and all of these things when there hasn't been kind of that trust built. Now, in some circumstances, there's no need to wait on that when there's immediate danger. So if you see someone being abused, or if you see something that's black and white, like in my line of work, there are days where I see something that's so black and white that I I don't have the time for that person's safety to do the you know the gymnastics of building a relationship and building trust and things like that. So that doesn't work in every situation because you want to respond to emergency situations with emergency actions. But in that case, when it's someone online or someone you know, you have a little more room to try to have a trust building conversation. And so Alyssa and I just kind of went back and forth on some ways that she could do that because you want the door to stay open. As soon as the door closes, that conversation has ended. And that's a real art (laughs) when you're dealing with someone who's walking through something really difficult. And I've learned the hard way how to have those delicate conversations. I've had that conversation door slam straight in my face because I didn't do the kind of first few steps of creating a like an atmosphere in a conversation of trust. That was the conversation we had with that listener. On the other level of someone you know really well. So this would be someone that you have long history with that maybe not a great relationship, but a deep one, Some someone that's in your closer circles. That trust might, if it's a good relationship, still be there. And when it comes to that, I think the most important thing to remember there is the conversation about not attacking behavior, but remembering there's something under the behavior. Because this is what I, at least I know to be true about my own life. When it comes to people in my family or people I know really well, you know, we kind of go into this like, how could you be doing that? Don't be dumb, right? (laughs) Like when we know people, you're like, don't do that. Like, you know better. And all these phrases that we easily use with people who are in our inner circle. But we have to remember that just because we know better doesn't mean that they might. That some of the behavior is stemming from trauma that is unrelated to what you're seeing. But when it's someone you know really well, you can cross that conversation bridge a lot faster because more than likely there's some sort of history of trust that's been built. So I think the big difference would be having the conversation quicker, but still remembering that even if you know them really well, external behavior is simply a manifestation of internal reality. And so When someone isn't being trafficked and is engaging in sexual exploitation of their own, you know, decision or engaging in the sex industry, I should say, maybe through exotic dancing or prostitution or selling images online and all of those things. When they're not in the lane of human trafficking, you have to remember that whole conversation needs to be wrapped around what's under these behaviors, because that's going to get you down the long-term conversation of healing, right? Because we know behavior modification isn't going to fix anything. Someone just changing their behavior without experiencing transformation in the roots of who they are, that behavior is just going to morph into something else. Now, if human trafficking has happened, so this is like kind of the third conversation, that's a whole different conversation and ball game, right? Like in in the listener's case, I did my homework and did some research and, and tried to really figure out what might be going on in that situation. If you do come upon a situation that human trafficking is suspected, and it doesn't have to be confirmed, I want listeners to really hear me. One of the reasons people don't report human trafficking is because the first thing they typically think is, surely it's not as bad as it looks, right? Or there's no way that's what's happening. Because we see, you know, it's kind of this like TV movie thing that we're like, there's no way. Or if I call and report that, and it's not that right, we have all of these insecurities. But if if you suspect that it's anywhere close to that, immediate action does need to be taken. And sometimes in doing that, you do upset the apple cart (laughs) of the person that's involved. But that's a really tricky decision to make, right? Of like, you are in immediate danger and I need to, now that I know that I need to do something about it. So I think like in summary, (laughs) this is such a nuanced conversation because in America, where the sex industry and exploitation and human trafficking cross 
is a very blurry kind of Venn diagram. It's very hard sometimes to know exactly what's going on, which is why in our ministry, we focus so strongly on relationship with women who are actively prostituting or actively engaging in online escorting or in exotic dancing or pornography, not for the agenda of just saying, hey, you need to quit doing this, but long-term relationship because it's through those relationships that you really get a full picture of her, her life, and what actually is going on. And then, you know, you can be a better advocate because you know the person. So where that's possible, that's always the route that we take. Even if we meet a girl in a hotel room and only have, let's say, an hour to have a conversation with her before she's transported or moved, we still take the approach of a relational conversation. We don't want to go straight into, uh, we don't want to just attack it, We want to give space for her to feel safe and seen and known and loved so that there's trust to then ask the really hard questions. And so I know that I just said a lot of information, but I think kind of boils back to is we have to remember that at the bottom of this cause, really what's there are people and people are very complicated, (laughs) just like you and I are. And so just remembering that as we approach any person that we believe may be engaging in dangerous behavior, I would just say, remember, they are a person and that trust and felt safety is one of the first things that we need to do to be able to advocate for them. Okay. I appreciate you taking the time to correspond with that listener and do your homework and do the research so that you knew exactly the approach she should take and yeah, whether or not, because I mean, I'm sure there's people... I mean, you can speak to this. I'm just assuming that just because you see an adult, if they're over 18, they can make their own decisions, making videos or selling videos online for money. They could either be doing it themselves or there might be another one behind it that's making them do it. And that to me is terrifying. That's a, that's a really important, actually a really important point. And this is something we teach even to those that we offer resources to who have been arrested for buying sex online. One of the things we try to talk about is there's really no way for you to know which it is. If it's her doing it of her own decision or when it comes to online or if someone has done that because there's just no way to know that, right? And so I think it is important to know that If we see something online that looks dangerous or kind of checks our spirit or puts something on our radar, we need to engage it because we don't know. Like there's just no way to know unless you have the initial conversation. And I think what sometimes people do is go, uh, that's none of my business. Surely not. That can't be what's going on. And they move on. But the truth is there's no way for you to know until you kind of engage that difficult conversation and, and find out more information. So when you said you, when you're working with people that are on the other side of it, they're the ones buying the pictures or the videos, is explaining that to them kind of getting into their human side and the rational side of like, hey, I need you to understand that while yes, you may want this video or this picture selfishly for yourself, you need to understand you might be assuming that she did that on her own. But there's also a chance that she's being abused, drugged, forced, then would you still want the video or the picture? Right. So um, in our context, when we're working with men who have kind of contributed to the demand, typically the, the audience is men who have purchased sex through prostitution online. So we're not talking about pictures and videos because there's another gray line, but pornography is legal for adults. Again, super gray area, right? It's illegal when true. it comes to children. Yeah. So, so pornography is legal. But when we are engaging with men who have um, purchased sex online through prostitution websites and things that we talked about on the other Uh, episode, one of the things we're trying to do is arm them with information. They know that it's illegal. Okay. So a lot of times people are like, you're giving them too much compassion. They know it's illegal. Well, we know that because they got arrested. (laughs) So like they know it's illegal, but typically they don't know much past that. They don't know what they are actually engaging in. And so one of the parts of the curriculum is we say, you know, we help them understand that when they go online and they click on a link and they engage in setting up setting up an appointment 
with a woman for prostitution purposes. When she shows up at their door and, and comes into the hotel room, it's just the two of them. There's no way for that in the legal system, they're called Johns. There's no way for the buyer or the John to know the reality behind that transaction. Meaning that a lot of times for us, it's not minority of the minority of the cases. It's not like a small amount. Most of the time when we do sting operations or when we're out in the community with law enforcement, there's someone in the parking lot that has forced them to do it. There's a pimp present or somewhere close. That's actually not that rare for us. The scary part is you wouldn't, as a buyer, you would not know that because what you're seeing is she just walks in and does what you've paid her to do. What they don't understand is she's on a timer. If she doesn't come down at a certain time, someone's coming in for her. There's even been cases where there's a kid in the car that's kind of being held over their head. Like if you don't come back, you know, all of these things. But a buyer would never be privileged to that information. And so what we try to do is help them understand what could be going on to uh, use that information as a deterrent from that behavior in the future. Because that's a pretty hefty dice to roll. Because one of the things we ask is, raise your hand if you would ever engage in human trafficking. And of course, no one in the room raises their hand. But then what we ask at the end is, raise your hand if you think you might have. Because the truth is, the crime can't be pinned on them, but they fueled it, right? Without even knowing it, they contributed to human trafficking by that one kind of transactional decision that they made. And so I say that across the board you know, we like to think we know a whole lot more about things than we actually do. And assumptions get us in a lot of trouble. And so when we look at behavior, a lot of times what happens is we see a woman acting a certain way, we decide, well, that's just how she is, right? Or can't be as bad as it looks. And so we don't engage. And we just don't know. Until we engage, we don't know what's really going on. And so that's what I mean by the relational approach is I'm going to put skin in the game here. Even if it means I get into this and she doesn't want help and all those things are true, what's the worst thing that's happened, right? Is I've just maybe wasted some time, but you actually haven't wasted time. Because this is the last thing I'll say. Anytime you reach out to someone and offer them kind of like a rope of rescue, and let's say you do that and they turn you down, what you've done for them is you've created in their mind a space where they can go if they're ready. And so none of those things are a waste. Thank goodness, because my whole career would be a waste (laughs) because most of my time is spent with people who don't give a rip about healing or recovery on the front end. But what you see is because you're consistent and you love them anyways, and you come alongside them, you show up in their territory. What you do see is down the road, if crisis happens or when they hit the crossroads, they know exactly where to go because you've extended it over and over and over again, even when it's rejected. And so we've seen a lot of lives be saved simply because that woman knew exactly who to call and where to go because we had extended and engaged in that way. So I would say, don't fear wasting time. Don't fear having the wrong conversation because if down the road, that person is experiencing something dangerous, they will know that if they reach out to you, you can handle it. And that's really, really important. And so um, that's what we mean by a relational approach to these um, really difficult conversations. Awesome. Well, thank you for that advice, Cassie. And people can continue to send notes if anything pops up into your head in the next weeks months, years, Cassie has made this her life's work. So make sure you reach out. And her website is thehubministry.org. And there's a lot of different things that they're involved in. Cassie's involved in and the whole ministry uh, purchase is just a part of, of what they do. And that is their ministry that's dedicated to what we've been talking about today. So thank you for your wisdom, Cassie. I appreciate it. And We're going to keep having you back on. They're very important. And I just want to keep this at the front of people's minds um, so that we can try to at least do our part to be educated, be informed, and try to make a difference somehow, somewhere, some way. So thank you for all that you do and for talking with us from your tiny house. I know right now (laughs) you're squatting down in your laundry room and... (laughs) 
Fun fact about Cassie, you guys, she lives in a 650 square foot home with her husband and two kids and they are living the tiny house life. They downgraded not too long ago, but you were in like 2,700 square feet and now you're in 650. So that's quite the change. Yes. <laughs> two years ago. Yeah. We went from 2,700 down to about 650. And I say 650 because I'm counting the one little closet. <laughs> Livable space is probably more like 620. So. But every square inch counts is what I say. So, But we love it. And I will say this, my I have two internationally adopted children. And one of the things we looked at for the size of our house was actually the size of houses where they're from. Um, because we thought, man, like, well, one, you learn a lot about, you know, just the way that we live here in America. And so we actually live in, in a house that represents more the normal square footage of a house where our children are from. One day we were outside in our pool because we randomly have a pool with a tiny house. It's a long story. But and my oldest, we were just playing in the pool and she w was sitting on the side and she looked at me and she's like, mom, we live a mansion life. And I just was like, man, like that is the most rich, coolest statement that like, and it was right after we had downsized. And so that in her heart, the square footage of our home didn't matter. And I think what happened was when we went tiny we actually did find kind of a mansion life in the sense of, gosh, like so much about who we are expanded and we, our experiences expanded. We can travel more. It's just been incredible to see from their perspective that they felt freed up from a smaller house and just were so thankful. They were thankful for the downsize. And so they were kind of the genesis of why we did it in the first place. And so it's been tricky during a quarantine lockdown. I am not a superhuman. I will say I've had many meltdowns because this is a very small house to be locked in for months. But even in that, we have seen God do incredible things just through the decision to live in this, uh, in this home. So we love it. We do. We love it. Well, you continue to amaze me. Thank we'll you. definitely be having you back on. And thank you for sharing. Yes, I would love it. Bye. Bye.